Hi, uh, my name is uh, Fran Brown. I'm a managing partner at Stack and Lou. With me, I have uh, Rob Reagan. Uh, I'm a senior security associate at Stack and Lou, and we're a company that helps uh, IT uh, organizations secure their businesses. Yeah. Um, and this is Tenacious Diggity. If you guys are looking for FX, uh, we pulled a switch uh, with him. We're looking to get all of his fans um, and uh, make some new fans ourselves. So uh, this is Tenacious Diggity. Ready to rock your socks off? How hard it rocks on a scale of one to ten. Yeah. Um, quick question: How many people have here have seen some of the talks that we've given before on previous versions? Cool. Thanks for coming back. We got a lot of new stuff. Yeah. Cool. Cool. So, um, with that, um, I'm going to jump right into a demo. Just to let you guys know, uh, kind of set the pace for what we're what we're looking to do here. Um, uh, now. Uh, it, it seems like a handful of people have seen some of our talks before. It seems like most people are newcomers. Uh, but basically these uh, diggity tools, uh, arsenal of tools that we've released are uh, a number of search engine hacking tools that use Google, Bing and various other search engines in interesting ways uh, for search engine hacking. Um, we're going to see, um, so we, we have uh, Google diggity which is what you would think of as a traditional Google hacking type tool but upgraded to all the latest APIs and things like that. And we have Bing Diggity which is what you would think of as a Bing equivalent of a Bing hacking tool or of a Google hacking tool. Um, but that's really not what we're going to focus on today. Uh, we're going to focus on all new attack tools that we have. And um, what we've continued to do besides just Google and Bing hacking is um, what, what other ways can we utilize different search engines or existing search engines and weird features of them. And, uh, new and interesting ways to find vulnerability information or you know find sensitive information disclosures. Um, so this uh, first talk is or this first video is going to uh, be of code search diggity which um, the new version of search diggity which is the tool we see up here right now is the main attack tool uh, which contains all other tools uh, that we have for our um, for our diggity attack tools. Right. These are all, all categorized under open source intelligence gathering. And that's to find uh, information using freely available sources and produce actionable intelligence on it. So we're looking not just at the general search engines that are available, but also specialized search engines. Uh, and one of those being uh, Google Code Search. Um, so we'll, we're just going to show an example of, of, of what we can do with a specialized search engine like Google Code Search. I'll just give you a better under, understanding of uh, what our tools are used for. Yeah. And if, uh, those of you guys who are familiar with Google Code Search uh, in general uh, know that it went away a few months ago, but uh, as of the latest release, we, we found some workarounds and uh, it's back in 3.0, which is available for download on our website now. Google Code Search reborn. Reborn. Back from the dead. Yeah. Um, so th those of you not familiar with Google Code Search, Google Code Search is another Google product just like Gmail or you know, something along those lines that uh, originally was designed to allow people to have full regular expression uh, search capability over every open source code project. Things like GitHub, CodePlex, SourceForge and Google's own sub uh, freely available subversion repositories. Mm -hmm. And we found that uh, developers uh, often put sensitive information in in their code and maybe they're an independent contractor and they're using those free resources to manage their pr uh, code for their clients. Um, or uh, we can also utilize regular expressions against a search engine like that to find vulnerabilities like uh, sim simplistic examples of SQL injections or cross-site scripting or other uh, web application vulnerabilities. Yep. So um, this first demo that I'm about to play right now is uh, what we like to call taking over someone's Amazon cloud in 30 seconds or less. Um, so what we're going to be doing here, you see I have uh, the code search interface up. I'm just going to go ahead and check a number of uh, uh, regular expressions that we have set up to find Amazon EC2 keys embedded in people's uh, open source code projects. And for those of you that don't know, EC2 keys are like the keys to the castle uh, of an elastic cloud uh, service provided by Amazon. This can be things like S3 storage uh, for storing large, uh, amount, large amounts of data or files or it can also be for the actual admin keys to manage that elastic cloud. That means that's the interface where you can put up new servers uh, or take down servers. And of course if an attacker were able to get access to these keys, uh, they could put up new servers on someone else's dime. Um, or they could find sensitive information potentially exposed in their S3 storage. So we see here in this uh, uh, Google Code project EC2 sample um, in the uh, file statetest.java, someone has went ahead and embedded their Amazon EC2 keys. Uh, their uh, access key and their secret key, which like Rob said, is 
pretty much the equivalent of your username and password to be able to access someone's uh, Amazon Cloud. Uh, so we're just going to take that and using a Firefox plugin uh, called uh, S3 Fox Organizer, we're just going to plug in this access key and secret key um, that we got out of somebody's state test.java, some random test file. Add, and now we have access to their Amazon S3 cloud storage. To verify that we actually had it, we downloaded a single file, ec2server.txt, literally the first file we downloaded. Um, open that up and we see a text file by developer of uh, administrator credentials, uh, database administrator credentials, um, VPN administrator credentials, literally, you yeah, um, you, you would think this is too good of an example that like, I probably like combed through them for days. This was literally the first file I ever downloaded in this manner and it just worked out that way. So it was, you know. Right. Developers don't think people are going to have access to their source code. They you hard code all kinds of secret, uh, secret keys and secret data in there. Um, and, and that uh, also goes for developers that are putting things out on these freely available uh, code repositories, um, not thinking that they're being indexed by search engines and easily searchable. So in this video, we're going to see another thing again. We uh, similar searches, a few keys embedded here, um, but this time we're going to use a tool called another free tool called Elastic Fox. Um, open that up, uh, create a new instance with this again, this Amazon access key and secret key. But this time, instead of just their file storage, uh, we're actually going to take over their entire EC2 um, instance. Click go, and then we pull up. We see that. We're now connected and we see that they actually have one uh, virtual server running um, that we can uh, administer at this point, a number of images up that are available to run. And at this point, uh, we're just, because one developer um, embedded in some random open source code project and some random file that they thought no one would ever look at, uh, their Amazon uh, keys, we now can take full control of their Amazon EC2 uh, instance and uh, fire up our own virtual servers, yep. take over theirs. Uh, do whatever we want at this point. A large organization probably isn't going to notice a few more servers added to their cloud, and uh, that there, there you go, hackers free, uh, free computing power. Um, that's uh, something that we've seen in our uh, client source code as we're, we've done code reviews. And really, the protection against this is uh, a lot of these public cloud providers now do allow you to lock down those keys to have uh, a minimalist set of permissions. And so that's really the recommendations to developers is only purpose this key for, for one server, only purpose it for, for one use, and don't, be, don't hard code those keys that have complete admin control over the cloud or over the storage um, in your code. Those need to be uh, really closely guarded secrets. Yep. Um, so we just like to start out with that because it kind of gives you an idea of besides, you know, just a slightly updated, better version of Google or Bing hacking tools, um, some of the new directions that we're trying to take things in, in terms of other uh, search interfaces um, out there that we can uh, leverage to uh, in interesting ways for hacking. Yeah, we only think that search engine innovation is going to uh, continue to explode over the coming years. Uh, it, there's going to be, you know, more and more competition out there. There's going to be uh, more and more highly purposed uh, search engines, and we want to utilize those um, for uh, attack purposes and defense purposes. Yeah. Um, so we're um, uh, really quickly just going to go through um, and uh, show you uh, uh, just a list of some of the tools we've done in the past. Um, and, but then move right on to all entirely new tools that are um, on uh, the 3.0 version that was uploaded to our website as of like an hour ago. Um, uh, for you, those of you who want to read about the, the old tools, uh, can check out the videos from last year. Yeah, just to reiterate that all this, everything we're showing is for free on our website, stacklu.com. Yeah. Um, so, uh, uh, those of you not familiar with our project, it's the Google Hacking Diggity project. Um, it's, a, uh, it's a project where we release a number of uh, open source, not open source, uh, free anyway, uh, free uh, search engine hacking tools, uh, kind of broken up by attack tools and defensive tools. Our defensive tools, which we're not going to spend too much time on uh, today, uh, primarily rely on Google Alerts and other alerting and RSS capabilities to uh, feed us um, real time updates from Google and Bing and Shodan and other search engines um, as Google finds a new website that would have matched. Uh, you know, some Google dork, we're getting real time uh, RSS updates about it and kind of created a sort of intrusion detection system uh, for Google hacking, if you will. And we'll um, show you some updates we've made to that. Yeah. Um, some of the old tools, uh, if you guys are, we have, I mentioned earlier that Google Diggity and Bing Diggity, it's uh, traditional Google and Bing hacking tools. We have uh, Flash Diggity, which is a Adobe Flash uh, security scanning tool, which leverages uh, Google and Bing to find 
uh, Swift files out there, bulk download them, uh, bulk uh, decompile them back to their action script, and then bulk uh, right. look through them for Adobe Flash vulnerabilities. So we're penetration testers, and we tried to design these tools with penetration testers in mind. We wanted to be able to target multiple sites at once. We wanted to be able to download and export the results to CSV files. We wanted to be able to uh, gather all the information that we need uh, as part of the footprinting phase, and, and really it's the step one of, of any penetration test. Um, our uh, DLP diggity tool, which I really encourage people to try, I went out and uh, took every data loss prevention tool that I could find, um, and I stole all the regexes for social security numbers and credit cards and things like that, and compiled a master list of uh, regular expressions that'll look through files for uh, interesting data. And this allows you to bulk, go out and find uh, uh, thousands of documents, you know, download all of them, and then uh, look through them for credit cards and passwords and right. social security numbers. We'll, we'll see what that looks like. Um, but that's, uh, that's all the old tools. I want to get right into uh, some of the new tools um, that I want to show you today uh, that we just released. Um, and with that, we're going to go right into the first one with, uh, uh, but even before we get into that, um, one thing to note, uh, until this uh, version, um, we had hooked up the uh, Bing uh, API for uh, Bing Diggity and the uh, Google Custom Search API for Google. But um, now that Bing is moving to a pay model and uh, just to get the number of results that we really want. We've implemented across all of the attack tools um, uh, scraping of Google, which uh, was no easy uh, task. Um, I spent quite a bit of time uh, trying to make it so that you can do thousands and thousands of queries against Google uh, scraping and um, effectively. And uh, we built that into the actual engine for all the tools now. So it's all completely free. You don't have to sign up right, we for the APIs. That. We found that API key to not be adequate, and now across all the tools, we can, we can scrape Google effectively and get tens of thousand results in a few hours, um, which is the only search engine hacking tool that can do that right now. Yep. And um, we've done it for Bing as well. And you know, uh, previously, you'd have to sign up for a Google uh, API key and, you know, and you'd get max like uh, 70 something results uh, per search. We now you're getting 1,000. Yeah, we want it for free and we want to get a thousand results. And uh, one of the interesting things as well is that um, we actually have the ability to scrape the custom search engine interface. So you can actually get a thousand results from a custom search engine of Google that you built. Um, so all the benefits and none of the drawbacks. Um, and this is just kind of giving you an idea of an overview of some of the things we're doing in terms of taking your queries, spreading them across hundreds of proxies, and spreading those across, you know, uh, dozens of Google servers um, and different settings and dropping cookies and things like that to uh, try to avoid uh, bot detection. Yeah, so we did all the legwork and the research on, on how to, how to, what query string parameters you need to send and, and how to best make your uh, scraping look like a human uh, as to prevent uh, Google detecting you as a bot and put that in the this, this suite across all the attack tools. Yeah. So you can manually import proxies and things like that or we, we tried to make it as simple as possible. You could just open up this uh, options proxies, do auto find. We go out and scrape a bunch of proxy sites for you and click test and it'll test if they're fast you know, and not giving you garbage or inline ads or, you know, messing with the responses uh, and take care of all that for you. And it's, uh, you know, all seamless in terms of being able to spread all of your queries across tons of uh, proxies. Real quick, I was asked to mention that track one and four were switched in case you didn't know. Yeah. And depending on which one you're looking for, it's, it's here. Yeah. Um, and uh, you can also uh, manually specify the proxies here. So uh, it just seems like some options configurations, but I can't tell you. I mean, this has really opened it up where you can now do Google and Bing for free. Um, and instead of getting, you know, dozens of results, uh, you can get hundreds of thousands and of results very easily. Right. Um, and if you, doing if, this. if you need a list of, of valid open HTTP proxies, I'd recommend going out to, there's tons of services like this that you can pay like $25 for a lifetime subscription to something like hidemyass.com. Yeah. And get 1,500 known good open HTTP proxies emailed to you every day. Yeah. Email your text files uh, every day, once a day, of you know all the latest proxies. And just import into this tool, and now you're you're effectively scraping Google and Bing. So that being said, right into our first uh, new attack tool, uh, Port Scan Diggity. So Port Scan Diggity is uh, kind of a really interesting tool that works on a feature of Google that is not documented and technically shouldn't even work, um, as far as as far as I know. Uh, but what we're doing here is we're actually uh, finding uh, uh, websites that are listening on non-standard uh, TCP ports uh, that Google has basically went out there and indexed, you know, all 65,000 some odd ports. And I, I don't know exactly how or why they're doing this. We have a few theories. Uh, but you can effectively do uh, passive port scanning 
uh, instantly through Google. So, um, you know, with the advantages of being passive, you're not actually, you know, you're only talking with Google, you're not actually talking to your targets. And yeah, I, I, I use this during scoping of engagements actually to try to see what other web servers are available out there because I haven't actually touched the client sites yet, but I'm able to see uh, these HTTP services um, that uh, exist. Uh, the other big event you can do by domains as well as by IP address ranges, and we see here on the right side, you see um, uh, we pretty much are able to cut through an entire B class instantly, uh, at least as far as what Google knows about in terms of uh, what IPs and what open ports there are. And you see port, you know, 999. Yeah, that would take a lot longer if you're trying to use Nmap. Right? Yeah, months or, you know, depending <laughs> on if you're trying not to get detected. Um, but to scan an entire B class for a full port range. Um, so this is kind of, uh, I'll show you the tool in a second, but this is kind of to give you a background of how it's actually working. Um, not only can we uh, just do the star and get a list of all uh, websites listening on random ports, you can even specify exact port ranges. We see 8,000 to 9,000 here and 5,000 to 6,000. Um, being able to just get a, a complete list. And, and one other thing uh, besides just being a port scan, when you think about this, every single one of these results, you see 216,000, 400,000 results. Almost every single one of these are some web administrative interface of some kind. So it's, and especially combined with the scraping that we have now, it's an effective way to get millions of web administrative interfaces listening on random uh, ports right. out there the, the reason instantly. They're, the reason they're not on uh, standard ports is they're not really meant to be found, right? Yeah. In like five minutes of playing with this tool, I found an uh, admin interface to a strip mall that accepts PayPal payments to buy products, and they had exposed on that admin interface the ability to add yourself as an admin user and then get in and review orders and, and shipping addresses and things like that. Like, th these are things that are not meant to be seen and uh, generally have a lax of security around them. Yeah. And it can be used for... Uh, I don't know if any of you guys saw uh, in the news uh, two weeks ago. I think it was uh, where they were somebody was uh, selling uh, Ode for uh, for Plesk Panel uh, web administrative interface uh, that was out there. So we see there on the left, just doing a quick search for you know port eight four four three and getting uh, sixty six thousand uh, likely candidates for that are running uh, some version of uh, uh, Parallels Plesk panel management uh, right. web interface. The so day so. was literally like point at the admin interface and then through a vulnerability in the admin interface get me uh, the password to log in as full admin. Yeah. So in an age where we're seeing, you know, like mass SQL injection attacks and massive scale attacks of, you know, compromising and using as malware distribution platforms, hundreds of thousands and millions of sites, this is a really easy way to go about doing something like that in terms of uh, mass exploitation. Um, but just to give you an idea of, so that's kind of how it, uh, works in theory, and to show you how the tool actually works, take advantage of it. Uh, we actually just created an interface here in our main uh, tag tool. I click, uh, I just put in com in the top right and click go. It finds for me um, every result that it can in terms of uh, web uh, interfaces listening on non standard ports. And now I specify the 8443 just to t target our uh, Plesk panel, which I uh, mentioned earlier. And now we could see, uh, so we have the view of the actual raw results, uh, the URLs and things like that. And then you can even switch over to uh, more of like a port scan uh, kind of result view and see a list of hosts that we found and a list of uh, ports that were open on those hosts, um, effectively giving you um, how would you use this on your own? Uh, let's say you were wellingtonflorida.gov. Uh, uh, I would plug in wellingtonflorida.gov and let me check port 8,000 to 9,000. And we see it found two hosts, um, one with a website listening on 8080, one with one listening on 8443. So we can effectively cut through and do port scanning via Google now. And then export the results out to CSV and load that up into uh, Burp or whatever. What, maybe you want to run some active web scanning on it. And, uh, but, but this was step one. You've identified all these uh, admin interfaces that you can then manually go take a closer look at. Cool. Any questions on that so far, or anything we, we went over so far? I only got 50 minutes. I want to a lot. I want to show you guys. Cool. Um, so just getting back into it. And so we see again a list of uh, ports open uh, for each host. So now, uh, one of the more interesting uh, new attack tools I want to go over, um, and something that uh, really evolved out of a need um, that just kept coming up and coming up again. It's a not in my backyard diggity. Um, is uh, one of our new attack tools. And 
Uh, just looking at the uh, Verizon uh, data breach investigation report from this past year, um, they kind of jokingly put out there that um, you know perhaps we should create a new breach uh, discovery classification of YouTube and Pastebin and Twitter, uh, just get, uh, given all the raw amount of uh, data dumps uh, from compromises out there on Pastebin and uh, things of that nature, um, uh, noting that a large percentage of uh, uh, people finding out that they've had an incident uh, only comes once people brag about it on Twitter or, or dump all the emails and passwords on Pastebin or something of that nature. Right, and, and that, was, like, that was partially the inspiration for, for Not In My Backyard, but also we saw the need from one of our clients that has hundreds of domains that they're, they're responsible for, and they were being targeted by LulzSec and Anonymous, and they said, you know, uh, a lot of the stuff that, that we're seeing isn't necessarily an issue on our site. It's, it's data that's being stolen and put on another site. How can we use search engines to find that? And that's, that was uh, really what brought about Not In My Backyard. Yeah, so I mean, we really wanted to make it as easy as possible for you to plug in uh, your domain or your email or even your name as an individual, uh, check a bunch of boxes and click go and find your sensitive information all over the internet on third party sites from cloud storage to Pastebin to wherever um, uh, really easily um, to see if your personal information has been exposed on a third party site you don't control uh, you know, that is not, your, not in your backyard. Um, so we see here a number of uh, Pastebin leaks, just uh, usernames and passwords being dumped uh, on Pastebin. Also uh, some of the more interesting ones is people are really starting to, individuals are starting to move over to use Dropbox and Google Drive and Microsoft SkyDrive and a number of other you know, cloud-based storage, especially as people get iPads and iPhones and yeah. want to be able to easily hook that up with their cloud-based storage. And employees are throwing confidential financial information and spreadsheets up on their Dropbox and then not realizing mm -hmm. that, that Google may be indexing that. Or I see more and more people using Google uh, Docs for managing sensitive information, not realizing that that's in Google's index. And we just see a couple examples here of finding um, in Dropbox a complete tax form with people's personal information to full database dumps in SkyDrive to uh, people's uh, Cisco configuration. Uh, files uh, hosted in uh, Google Docs. Um, not realizing that these public folders are being indexed by Google and easily searchable. But uh, one other interesting thing that we found, um, and this is kind of important, is that um, robots.txt is dead. Uh, Google is not abiding by robots.txt anymore. And if any of you guys, how many people here use Dropbox in any way? Decent amount of people. How many people have clicked the setting when prompted for the newer? Um, you know, I want to share all my photos via Dropbox um, that I take with my phone. Yeah, right. You plug in your phone and it just says, oh, yeah, upload all my photos that I've taken, right, and sync it with my Dropbox. Yeah, so um, recently, especially for um, Apple uh, devices, uh, it's, it's just a setting and most people are turning it on by default now. Um, just to, uh, as you take pictures with your phone, um, it's just automatically syncing to these galleries in Dropbox. And we see here in Dropbox's robots.txt, that uh, they're saying disallow this slash gallery, which is where all those things are hosted. But um, just a quick look on Google, and we see 164,000 uh, people's uh, personal photos uh, galleries have been indexed and are easily searchable. So we know um, who's via been Google. sexting. Yeah, actually, some really interesting personal photos out there. Probably spent a lot more time browsing through the photos than was really necessary <laughs> for the. Yeah. It's research. Yeah, it's research, honey. You know, I'm like, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Um, so uh, this is just yet again another place out there that people aren't realizing that. And in this case, uh, it's, you know, they're thinking that Dropbox, Dropbox thinks they're safe in terms of people aren't indexing this and Google's just doing it anyway. Um, so it's definitely a good recipe for being able to, you know, find uh, uh, the latest celebrities' uh, new photos that they want to send out on their phone all the time and, you know, things of that nature or your photos. Um, and uh, this is kind of part of the, just the data loss prevention side of it. Um, just looking for your information again out there. Uh, this was in the news uh, last year and there's been a million incidents since then. It seems like two a week now. But um, you know, just some Yale alumni just Googling for his own name uh, stumbled across an Excel spreadsheet with 43,000 of uh, Yale alumni's uh, social security numbers and all their detailed personal info. Uh, and just in one Excel spreadsheet that was just hanging out there in the wind. I'm just Googling for his own name. He happened to stumble across it. Right. So that, that's one of the beauties of Not In My Backyard is it can be uh, used by an organization or by an individual uh, for finding sensitive information disclosure. Yeah. Would have been helpful for, helpful for the uh, Yale alumni to run this tool. Um, so I'm going to pull up and uh, show you guys this in a second. But just some of the default locations that we're looking for. Um, 
we're basically going to be allowed easy to plug in a freeform text of your name, your email, a domain you're interested in, whatever you want to look for, select from a list of locations, um, which we see up here, and then select from a list of uh, certain files if you want to drill down on that, uh, file types, as well as a uh, select a number of uh, keyword groups that uh, narrow down and find more interesting information like data dumps. But um, some of the places that we're looking in terms of locations are we're looking uh, for at files across. By default, if you leave them unchecked, it's just looking for your name and stuff across the whole internet um, and what, are, what other filters you specify. But it, uh, it allows you to easily uh, narrow down and start looking in uh, cloud based storage, social networking, uh, you know, uh, document uh, sharing sites like Scribd. Um, uh, paste bin in every paste bin type site. Right. Uh, and, and again, we've, we've made this with the pen tester in mind or with uh, the, the hacker in mind. So this is completely extensible. And you can actually just go to where this uh, application installs. And it, these are all in text files and c the carriage return line feed delineated text files. And you can add your own sites in there. You can add more locations. Um, you can add your own queries that you want to run by default. And then uh, just restart the application. And that information will be loaded into the interface. Yep, and um, some of these are uh, some of these are things you would never even think of. Like, well, people, some people know the rate my network diagram uh, is a funny one, but uh, yeah, even in Glyphy, we're seeing uh, people hosting extremely detailed uh, internal network diagrams uh, on Glyphy and sharing them out, and you know, right? These are like online Visio applications, and, and people are just like putting their their confidential uh, or, or proprietary business workflows or their or their network diagram on there just to uh, show off. The, like, how, it's kind of funny that you know a lot of IT administrators may be uploading their uh, whole internal architecture to ratemynetworkdiagram.com and uh, and showing a, a, an attacker exactly what they would need to know and where to go once they they get inside. So what we see here is the tool, and we have you would plug in uh, up in the targets your name, things like that, whatever you want to do. Then we have the uh, locations tab. In this particular example, I'm just going to look on Pastebin only, but it'd be easy for you to just check all those boxes. Um, in this case, since it's Pastebin, I'm not going to uh, specify any file type, but we will allow you to easily put like let me just look in Excel spreadsheets or database backup files or things like that. Um, and then we're going to select the keywords for uh, that are good for finding. Uh, uh, data dumps of personal information. I click. Uh, so we see that it comes back with some results from Pastebin. I'm um, just looking at this one here. We see Osiris owns uh, Max Protec, and we see uh, a few uh, passwords and some headers here for Pastebin. Um, so we go ahead and click that, and you see some data dump from um, some hacker that has hacked MaxProtec.com. If any of you guys use MaxProtec.com, you might want to go. Check that out, um, uh, and we see here anyone who's uh, bought anything off them, their their names, their uh, personal addresses, their email that they register with, and the password that they used. Um, so just as an example of how an individual would use this, besides just searching for everything, let's say that I was Chuck uh, dot uh, hsu at uh, at Wiley dot com. Is Chuck in Chuck in the room by any chance? Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, sorry this, about uh, Bing energy drink is almost as terrible as his password. Yeah, <laughs> Ying Ying three one eight. So um, in this case, I would actually plug in. Let me use quotes. So this is going to you can uh, it'll use quotes for both Google and Bing, or allow you to do in text, which works better for Google, or in body, which works better for Bing, depending on. And you could check all of them. So in this case, I'm just going to put quotes. So it's just going to look for uh, Chuck uh, HSU's at Wiley's email. And uh, it's going to look across the things that I, uh, across Pastebin for information disclosures. Right. So we tried to make it as easy as possible for anyone to build these advanced queries uh, to go out and retrieve this information and, and really prepackage uh, a lot of the types of information uh, that you'd want to look for and where you'd want to look for it um, so that you can get those, the results to the top of your results. Um, which, which is an issue when you're dealing with so much data in these search engine indexes. Yeah, so you could see now um, if I was uh, good old Chuck, I would have just plugged in my name and clicked all the check boxes and it would have came back saying, hey Chuck, uh, some random site on Pastebin because you bought equipment at uh, Max Protech. Um, there is a link and you could see actually in the snippet of the results uh, his email address um, and his password and, and personal information there. That's kind of out as an individual how you would use it. Um, but you can plug in an email address, your name, uh, domain, whatever you want to look for, and it makes it very easy to. Um, if you don't uh, select any location, it looks across the whole internet. Um, you could select down by just uh, Pastebin or cloud storage, whatever you're interested in, or certain file types, uh, just Excel spreadsheets or CSVs, 
and then we have keywords that find patient records, personal information, data dumps, um, to things that, and basically it's just combining every permutation of all these different kind of factors and searching Google and Bing for them uh, for you, making it easy to find all of your personal information. Um, and we see that here kind of uh, pointed out, we got where to look, uh, what kind of files to look in, uh, keywords to help narrow down false positives, and you put your name or email or whatever up there. And we'll be putting up uh, videos of, uh, to demonstrate how to use these tools, and uh, so just check back on our website. Um, one other example, uh, just to show besides Pastebin, which is kind of an easy example, um, that I just thought was great, uh, is this time in the screenshots you see, we're looking in cloud storage, we're going to look for people who are uh, throwing files up on their Amazon S3 uh, cloud storage. Uh, we're going to be specifically looking at Excel spreadsheets, um, and I added the query appender, uh, pass just the word password and click go. We see a uh, copy of user.xls I found, um, and just to see what that would have looked like through the web interface, what it's kind of simulating is we see just uh, password, extension, uh, Excel spreadsheet. Yeah, note the other worksheets there. This guy had basically all of his bank accounts, all of his bills, all of his uh, other, other services, uh, his tax information uh, account, uh, and uh, uh, his investments, his FAFSA, healthcare, you, you yeah. name it, all in his, one his spreadsheet. Pin, his PIN for his ATM card. Yeah. I mean, this guy had everything in one Excel spreadsheet. And this is just one guy. Um, and if this is, if you are also in the room, I apologize. I did black out the, uh, the information. Um, but uh, this is just yet another, this is just like the Yale Excel spreadsheet with all their personal information. People just Googling for their own name are just stumbling across hundreds of thousands of uh, personal records and credit cards, you know, without even trying by accident. Um, and we're seeing this in the news like twice a week now, it seems like, where some uh, major person has been compromised or is just throwing an Excel spreadsheet out there somewhere with hundreds of thousands of emails and passwords um, where you almost become numb to even looking at the, uh, um, the, the news headlines. It doesn't even say 100,000 results or more. I don't even bookmark this news story. Um, it's just so many. Yeah. So, any questions so far? So the question was um, for the Google Docs and the Amazon S3 one, were they public uh, documents where the permissions were set uh, to such? Uh, in this case, yes, they were. They weren't, they weren't blocked, but um, as we've seen, especially with Dropbox, have changed some of the rules and how they do things and sharing public folders and how uh, quickly these things are changing. Uh, people by accident are sharing things out, not realizing um, that they are public or that they can be public. And, and as we saw in the, the one case, um, some things that even are supposed to not be indexed are getting indexed anyway, and um, so it's, a, it's one of those quickly changing things where it's very confusing for a normal user. Um, or an employee at, a, at an organization that yeah. may not know any better, that may not, may not know how to configure those settings to, yeah. to make uh, some of the, uh, the stuff in these cloud documents yeah. uh, services private. Yeah, and where they want to share it out with someone to begin with, and you have to throw it in the public folder anyway um, to be able to share to a somewhere. link out to somebody, mm -hmm. and then not realizing who would ever guess this huge link and I think in the Google index that made it easy to find. Um, uh, so one other thing, and this is not so much a tool so much as an update to our uh, main Bing hacking dictionary. Uh, one thing I want to note is that due to some recent updates in Bing's API, um, as well as some undocumented or poorly documented features, uh, we have released um, an updated version, the Bing hacking database uh, version 2.0. Uh, before we released our first Bing hacking database, Bing or, you know, uh, MSM before that was uh, primarily used for footprinting, finding host names, finding applications or, you know, U URLs and things like that. And it was primarily for footprinting purposes. And that was because Bing had specifically disabled a handful of uh, features, uh, most notable of which was in URL, which broke like 95% of the Google hacking database. And they specifically did it to try to prevent Bing hacking, you know, in the sense of Google hacking. Um, and they did that back in 2007. Um, we released a, uh, we found some workarounds for that and we're able to release a thousand or so queries for the first Bing hacking database. Uh, but now we're proud to say in the latest version, um, uh, due to two major um, updates, uh, we are now for the first time are able to make Bing hacking just as effective as a tool as Google hacking. Um, and that's because one, uh, Bing decided to enable the ext colon uh, operator to allow you to search by file extension uh, within the last year. 
So that was one and two, and this was the big one. Uh, like 95% of the Google Hacking Database uses this in URL colon operator, which will allow you to specify uh, you know, random text that has to be found in the URL of the results. Um, by using this, and we see it in the screenshot here, in stream set colon URL colon uh, in Bing, you effectively get in URL. And you can do in stream set body, in stream set title, or other parts uh, of a typical HTTP, or I'm sorry, HTML uh, page. And, uh, but we found that using that in stream set URL, which is just kind of a footnote in their documentation um, that, that we came across, uh, we, we can revive yeah. Bing hacking and make it, as Fran said, just as viable as Google hacking. And we see in this screenshot this in stream set URL and WP config, and you see out there a, uh, a number of results of people with their WordPress uh, configurations with their database uh, passwords right there in the configuration file. This is a type of query that we would not have been able to do with Bing um, uh, before now. So uh, with the new version that we released in Bing Diggity, uh, we went from like a thousand or some odd um, mildly effective uh, queries to I think like uh, four to five thousand uh, queries that are now pulling vulnerability information um, out of Bing. So it's kind of exciting. Bing binary, Bing binary malware search. This is the one I just want to go over quickly. Um, but any, any of you guys familiar with HD Moore's tool, MW Search, from a few years back? Where it actually, it, search engines were indexing uh, PE header info? Uh, of executable files. Um, basically, HD had a tool that used Google uh, a few years back that um, allowed you to use Google to find people hosting malware uh, based on searching for uh, the PE header information. Uh, Google disabled that feature, uh, so it kind of broke its tool and uh, has been dead ever since. But people didn't realize that Bing does have the ability to do that as well. So, and using, uh, we see here a picture of HD's uh, old signature file and, and just throwing that up, uh, being able to find instances of malware uh, via Bing. We wanted to give something uh, back to always to like the malware researchers in the room as well, and, and so this is this is something that can be effectively used to identify uh, malware that's indexed by Bing. Although we we've, in our tests we found that it, it changes very rapidly, right? Because Bing doesn't want to distribute malware; they don't want malware in their results. So as soon as they're identifying them, they're they're removing them. But it's kind of like a, a first notice of, of okay, if I search this, I got uh, this uh, executable file back in the results, and uh, and I can identify that as malware uh, based on those that meta information like size of code, entry point, um, number of segments, and, and other uh, PE uh, or portable executable meta information. Um, so the results are somewhat limited um, in being able to find tons of malware at this point, uh, one due to them removing it, but two. Um, just looking at this, uh, we found some numbers on, uh, it's estimated from these uh, researchers that uh, Google's indexed about 50 billion pages and Bing has indexed about three billion. So in just in terms of role, you know, size does matter in terms of uh, role set of what you're looking for. Um, there's just not as many results in Bing as there is in Google uh, for finding things anyway. Although you see in that uh, graph in the last month, it claims that Bing jumped up from three billion to about 16 billion. But they're probably lying. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah, they lie all the time. So, I mean, if you ever clicked on it and it says a few hundred thousand results and you go to page two, page three of results, and it's like, okay, maybe there was like 20, 20 results. You know, you got us. You know, <laughs> page three is the end of it. Um, so, uh, who knows how reliable these numbers really are, but. Um, yeah, this was actually uh, done by a group that goes out and they do like Zip's law of st statistical analysis and they go out and search a lot of uh, keywords and uh, basically count the results that come back to those keywords and then uh, try to determine how, how much is in the index. Um, but uh, kind of using them combined is what, is what we think it works best, both Google and Bing. Cool. Um, so we got 10 minutes, so we'll speed along. Uh, code search diggy, this is what we showed in the intro. Um, it was dead, it's now back. We give the ability to uh, uh, search across, uh, the, the version that's hooked up on the website right now is just for Google code projects, but we'll shortly have um, everything back up and running. Uh, very soon, but you can at the very least uh, search all Google code projects, which is quite a bit. For SQL injection, we see here um, they're putting a request.query string uh, parameter right into a select statement. Um, so what we would do with this is this is some uh, trade form software. We can go out there and find SQL injection and some popular blog software, trade form software, shopping cart software, and then go to regular Google and do powered by 
that shopping cart software or something like that. And it's a quick way of uh, doing some blogging uh, software where we found SQL injection. Um, we found it was like 11,000 sites in China using the blogging software that was vulnerable to SQL injection? Yeah, so now we can just find, you know, find the targets. Now we know we would go to the post.asp page and we would tamper with the reply underscore ID parameter and we know exactly where to go um, for that for open source code. And the, uh, the way we're bringing this back is really uh, by utilizing some, some freely available cloud services uh, to go out and um, crawl the data. Uh, there's. Um, I, one, oh, thing, one thing, one thing, thing to note before we get into that is that um, uh, just with that example with the Amazon cloud hacking that we showed earlier, if you look at it, um, if any of you guys remember with the CIA triad of confidentiality, integrity, and availability, uh, basically uh, Amazon cloud and most cloud services uh, promise you nothing. In fact, they distinctly tell you that we are not guaranteeing you in any way, shape, or form the confidentiality, the integrity, or the availability of your data. You know, take it or leave it, kind of thing. So we have to you know broker a better deal. Going forward, as you know, every uh, employee out there and yeah. every corporation is just throwing stuff up in the cloud now. Just leave that to the legal department. Yeah. Um, so this is. Um, but uh, so as we we're saying, we're, we're bringing back code search by utilizing some of these cloud crawling-based services, and, and one in particular that I liked uh, uh, that where we found is 80 Legs, um, and this is a service that you can go and utilize uh, them to do your crawling for you. Even with a free account, they'll do 10,000 pages. And, and if you, the, the for pay accounts are just dollars on For 20 the, bucks, you get like 10 million pages indexed or something in a matter of like an hour. Right. Um, so we, we can actually program into this as seed values of where to start crawling and say, go out to GitHub, search for all PHP code, and use that as my seed page. And then I can put in a regular expression to say, uh, find all the links to the next page on that result for uh, all the PHP code and go crawl those, those pages. So basically it's gonna then download all the PHP code from GitHub. And then I can put in some regular expressions to do analysis on that and say now find me all the uses of include that are also taking in a query string parameter. And now I'm effectively identifying like remote file includes in these uh, open source PHP projects and getting those results back. And, and so as part of our efforts to, to make this available through our tool, we're pulling those results into uh, a cloud database that we can expose as a web service that anyone could make calls to, to effectively query vulnerability information um, in these open source code projects. And then we're gonna have our, our client be able to call that service so that you can use it in the same old user interface that we always had. Yeah, so if Google wants to shut it down uh, in favor of making you know, Google Plus or things like that, we decided to just do it ourselves and you know, uh, make it searchable. And, and this is really just a proof of concept that is uh, something that's really powerful that, that we identified as a, as a penetration tester. Like I, you know, I rely on, on certain tools and I rely on um, some things to go out and find certain types of information. But if I have so, a, a really large scope, um, I'm, I'm going to start turning to services like this to say, go crawl these 10 million pages and do this analysis on them and give me the information back. And, uh, and now I know I have some really good starting points of, of where I, I, I may want to start uh, probing um, uh, an entire large organization. Okay, we got five minutes left, so we'll just speed through these last couple. Um, Shodan Diggity. How many of you guys are familiar with Shodan, the search engine? Uh, it, for those good amount of people. It, it, it indexes uh, the actual um, headers that come back from a, a, a query to various services, uh, HTTP and things like Telnet, SSH, and actually records those and makes them searchable um, via an index. Yeah, it's like a search engine for uh, you know, network service banners, more or less. Um, but it's, it's really gotten some, uh, uh, some headlines in the last couple, um, in the last six months uh, due to uh, SCADA hacking, critical infrastructure uh, type things. Um, but basically what we're seeing is, you know, finding SCADA systems that are out there. Um, for the first time ever, and this is something I really want to stress, uh, uh, we have SCADA systems which are controlling everything from uh, the air conditions in buildings to manufacturing plant floors to the electric grid. The water pump that powers water pumps, like whole you name municipalities. It. Um, and these things have been around uh, for a long time and are very easy to hack. And in the last uh, six months, we've seen two uh, major things happen. One, we're seeing point and click exploits for the first time ever in Metasploit, where people are making it, you point it at a SCADA system and take control. So you have the ability to exploit easily, as well as two, the ability for mass identification. Just uh, one Cambridge student uh, putting out a PhD uh, paper, um, you know, half messing around found, you see that, uh, that map in the uh, middle bottom there, found uh, 10,000 SCADA systems uh, with a handful of Shodan queries 
uh, connected to the internet. All the red dots as opposed to greens are ones that a public exploit just came out for. So you have tens of thousands of systems that control water pumps to electric grids, all connected to the internet, easily findable by Shodan, and now easily exploitable on that exploit. Um, I'd be surprised in the next year if we didn't see some kind of major um, disaster um, of a physical nature. Um, so we've wired it up into our uh, user interface for and prepackaged it with a lot of useful queries so that you can start targeting uh, networks that you're looking at um, using the Shodan search engine and get the results back in a nice uh, malleable format. Yep. And I'll skip the demo for that, but this uh, you could just plug in your Shodan API key, have a bunch of pre uh, uh, queries already for you, and just provide a nice easy interface to use Shodan because um, we wanted to have one, so we decided to make one. Um, last, and I know we only have like two minutes, um, and I showed this before, uh, we have this uh, alert diggity DB. This is what's coming up next, where we have these hundreds of thousands of results we're getting from scraping now. We have three years of Google alert feeds and Bing feeds uh, that have been feeding into millions of entries. Things like four million records of uh, vulnerabilities and sensitive information. They correspond, and every single RSS entry that you see there corresponds to some website on the internet that is vulnerable to something that some Google or Bing dork found. Um, from several years of it. We have it in one table. Uh, we put up an Amazon RDS as a cloud-based database um, that we're going to be making available as soon as I work out the pricing model. Um, but you should see in the next few weeks uh, this available to be able to query this massive repository. So in the future, you won't actually have to um, go to Google and do Google hacking anymore because we've already done it for you. We've Google hacked. We've Bing hacked. We have several years of results. Uh, that it's all in one big table that instead of going out and doing Google hacking, you can just plug in and do a, uh, a single search and pull all the results from several years of Google hacking uh, and come to us instead of Google. We've, we've actually done this for some of our clients as kind of a custom consulting project and, and just focused on what was available in search engines and gotten back uh, a lot of really detailed information on, on what their exposure was and, and they appreciated that and were able to take that actionable intelligence and then go do some remediation. Yep. And uh, we're going to be hooking this up again to some charts and mobile uh, uh, business intelligence apps. So on your iPhone or iPad, you could just hook it up, say, I, I want to monitor these domains and get a filtered view of this huge, massive repository of uh, vulnerabilities on the internet, which is probably the world's largest single repository of live vulnerabilities on the internet that I'm aware of anyway. Unless you guys know of a bigger one and uh, get a nice little view of that. And this is, um, as Rob just mentioned, uh, just looking at how you guys can start to analyze some of this information. And this is from DLP, from a tool we did. I'll uh, be basically pulling down and, uh, you know, pulling down 13,000 documents uh, using on, some of our tools. This was on 54 domains for one of our clients, and, and they, they yeah. like, couldn't even wrap their head around, like, okay, we have 13,000 documents on, on these domains. What do we even do to start to analyze this? But we were able to use our DLP tool to start uh, identifying sensitive information in those documents. Yeah, so that's, um, that's kind of the very, very quick view. I think we're probably out of time now. Um, but uh, if you guys are interested in some of those other tools that we talked about, you can check out uh, videos. Or if you go to. Um, yeah, follow me on Twitter if you want to keep up to, uh, up to date on what we're releasing. So. Okay. The, uh, the project page is at the bottom right there. Um, all these tools are uh, free for download. The new version is 3.0. It's up on the website right now. Um, there'll probably be some uh, bug fixes and stuff, and uh, that's a pretty fully functional version. And then all the new tools, free for download, free for use, uh, will continue to be free, and it's uh, up on that website.